<laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, I will mute now. Yeah, if, if uh, you all could go ahead and mute yourselves now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started just because we have uh, a pretty um, tight schedule um, and people will just keep rolling in here in the next couple minutes, I think. Um, but uh, welcome. Happy National Invasive Species Awareness Week. Um, welcome to this forum. Um, it's nice to see that so many people have registered for this event. I think we had, uh, we were like 275 people. Um, my name is Anna Michi John. I'm the vegetation maintenance supervisor for the city of Tacoma Park. I'm co-hosting this forum with uh, Climate Action Coffee. Climate Action Coffee uh, and I share an uh, interest in the health of our green spaces. And we're happy to come together to try to increase the public awareness of invasive plants in our region and to showcase some of the good work that's being done. Uh, so before we get started, I just want to say a thank you to our speakers, Climate Action Coffee, um, and in particular, Marguerite Sire for helping to organize this. Uh, Climate Action Coffee is a project of uh, Tacoma Alliance for Local Living, uh, Tacoma Park Mobilization. This is a group of local residents concerned with mitigating climate change through citizen involvement. Climate Action Coffee meets weekly to exchange ideas and, and discuss the work of its three subgroups. Uh, these groups are the pollinators um, who are interested in biodiversity, pollinators, and food security. Climate Art Club, which engages middle schoolers about climate change through creative activities. And the Tacoma Park Stormwater Solutions, um, where members are concerned with finding solutions to Tacoma Park stormwater issues. To find out more um, about this group, and to find links to their meeting, go to their website. This is also um, where we are going to post a recording of this forum. Um, I'm gonna shut off my video. <clears throat> um, so we're gonna cover a lot of ground in the next hour and a half. You're gonna hear from five presenters um, working on invasive species um, in the region, but from different angles. Uh, I will start by telling you a little bit about the work that my team does in the city of Tacoma Park and how I see the topic of invasives fitting into it. Um, I will also then be standing in for our second speaker, Corinne Stevens, um, who isn't able to join us today. Corinne manages the Weed Warrior Program for Montgomery Parks, uh, which is a national model for training and engaging volunteers in invasive weed management. The presentation that Corinne prepared for us today is about that Weed Warrior program and introduces some of the local invasive plant species. At 1230, we'll hear from Sarah Tangren, an expert on natural resource issues, soils, and native plants in Maryland. She will talk to us today about the importance of early detection and response to invasive species. Uh, you may be familiar with some of uh, some invasive weeds like kudzu or English ivy but experts are on the constant lookout for new plants, animals, and diseases that may become problems in our natural areas. Then we have Jesse Buffs, Buff, excuse me, from Climate Action, uh, Chesapeake Climate Action Network. Um, Jesse's made a big impact in a short amount of time addressing tree health and English ivy in Montgomery County. And our final speaker will be Lily Fountain of the Maryland chapter of the Sierra Club and Brad Fallon from Delegate Lutke's office uh, to have an update of proposed legislation um, regarding the sale of invasive plants in Maryland. We've reserved a little bit of time at the end for questions and answers. Um, feel free to enter questions in the chat box at any time, but um, we will likely be holding those until the end. So, hello again. Uh, my name is Anna Michi John. Um, I recently joined the city of Tacoma Park uh, in the position of vegetation maintenance supervisor. I was excited about this team because there's such a nice space of green spaces and, and uh, kind of inherent appreciation of the value of plants and natural resources within the city. Um, but like any fragmented ecosystem, uh, invasive species are a part of that. So for those of you coming from England or other parts of Maryland, DC, Virginia, this is Tacoma Park here. We're a small municipality in Southern Montgomery County. 
Um, Silver Spring is our close neighbor. and We share a border here with District of Columbia. We are approximately 17,000 residents on two square miles. We have a good number of hills, natural springs, uh, uh, dense tree canopy. Um, our nickname is the Azalea City. Uh, that's thanks to Benjamin Morrison, who was a Tacoma Park resident in the first half of the 1900s, um, who was also the breeder of the Glendale Azalea Collection at the US Arboretum. Um, and he distributed um, some of his introductions throughout the city. Uh, so we're the team that is also uh, more commonly known as Gardens. This team is made up of myself, um, plus three permanent full-time employees. And then take a, typically we get a couple seasonal workers as well, as well. We maintain much, but not all of the city owned green spaces. Uh, altogether, we have over a hundred sites that we take care of, uh, but some of those are as small as hundred square feet whereas others are uh, multiple acre parks. About half of these sites are stormwater facilities. Um, altogether, it's about 14 acres, um, half of which is mowed, the other half is um, planted or treed. We have landscapes outside of uh, seven, excuse me, four city buildings. Um, we have seven city owned parks. We do not take care of playground equipment in my team. Um, bioretention facilities like the one you see here. Um, and as well as we have a couple spaces that are uh, specifically uh, called gardens. And then I put on here open spaces or natural areas. This is something that's um, a joint effort within Public Works. A new open space management plan is in development with our housing and community development office. Uh, much of what we do is what you would think of as gardening work. We take care of plantings around the city for aesthetics, public safety, ecological benefit. So doing things like weeding, pruning, et cetera. Uh, I believe horticulture is a skilled trade and I want my team to be skilled in the plants and the um, proper techniques to take care of these plants. Uh, most of what we do is hand labor. So unlike a lot of cities or landscape crews um, almost exclusively. Um, this is things where like uh, this longtime team member here taking care of this, um, removing this huge grass, whereas it could otherwise be um, treated with herbicides. We also take care of tree care on our park sites, as well as uh, assisting our city arborist. Um, as I mentioned, bioretention facilities, those come along with a specific set of maintenance and reporting requirements. Um, I also do design and installation on sites when they need either intensive overhauls or supplemental plants. Um, we work really hard and uh, we like what we do. So as stewards of these properties, we're trying to have well-maintained, aesthetically appealing public green hot spaces across our city using ecologically sound practices. Uh, we want to have the city plantings reflect and promote plants and practices appropriate for our region and conditions and approach with long-term vision and best practices. Um, I included uh, this photo here because this is one of our sites along um, Carroll Avenue. The Girl in the Vine is just off to the side here. Um, and we included this site in our work last fall um, because it touched on a, a few of our goals. Um, it had visibility issues. Um, it had some invasive ornamentals and it was really difficult for us to maintain with hand labor. Um, so rather than piecemeal it, we went through and are doing a major overhaul. And then we intentionally left it um, bare over the winter with mulch so that we could do um, good weed management before we plant it this spring. So you might be wondering why are we talking about invasive species um, for a garden group? Um, well, if my team's goals are to use sound ecological practices and promote sustainable horticulture while improving aesthetics, then I also wanna look at what plants are invasive in our region and encourage their management in our work. Particularly in our design spaces, um, having the sites viewed as cared for is important. You know, if you think about a garden that's smothered in porcelain vine, people might not recognize that as an invasive weed. Um, 
but they probably know that it doesn't look nice. Um, that's maybe an extreme example, but even in less severe cases, I want our plantings to have increased diversity and interest. I like the idea of um, what some people say, beauty and. We wanna find a comfortable place between having purely aesthetic value and only ecological considerations. Um, some people are now you know, phrasing this as sustainable horticulture or ecological horticulture. Um, uh, but I like, and I like the idea of uh, stewardship implying that we have long-term goals in mind. Um, so a little bit of a sidebar here uh, and explain what I am considering invasive species. Uh, this isn't a term that I use lightly. There's an entire field of study that goes into making risk assessments and surveys. Um, and I'm relying on that information. I'm mostly looking at two lists when I'm talking about invasive species for the work that we're doing. The first is the Maryland Department of Agriculture list. Um, this uh, is the list that um, has about 40 plants that are either regulated for sale or considered for regulation. These would be plants that are for sale as ornamentals within the state of Maryland. Um, of these, we have about 17. And then the second list that I have here is the Maryland Invasive Species Council, which lists 244 terrestrial species of concern. Uh, some of these um, are ornamentals and some of them are, are weeds that people wouldn't want anyway. Of these, we have about 40. I'm taking a conservative approach by looking at both of these lists, um, and, but consider other factors into how we're going to target them. Um, so it's difficult to make an absolute statement for how, our, how we manage every single weed when our sites are so varied. Um, but the first way that we do it is, to, is by regular maintenance uh, across the city. Um, a lot of just regular weeding will keep, help keep things in check. Um, then we also, I tend to favor planting species that originated from North America, um, taking a conservative approach and planting non-natives. Um, and we will not be planting or replanting things that are listed as species of concern. Um, every site that we visit also gets um, non-native vines removed from trees. This is important to reduce the spread of seed as well as maintain tree integrity. Um, Sometimes we may need to leave a, leave a plant that's considered invasive, but can prevent the seeds distribution until we're able to replace it. Um, that would be something like cutting off seed heads on miscanthus. And then badly degraded sites may need more intensive redesign. Well, hey, Guy. Um, these are pictures from one of our sites um, in Old Town, and I included these just to show you how we use those goals and our strategy together. Um, you see here the Chinese fountain grass. Um, this was a, a bit of a safety issue for low cars coming through. It was difficult to see. Um, this grass is also on the Maryland Department of Agricultural list um, for a uh, candidate for regulated sales. I'm seeing it pop up a lot around the city. And then the third reason was that this is a prominent spot in us for us. This is a um, part of the commercial district. And I wanted to be able to showcase non-native and native plant choices. Um, so you see the photo here on the right has the new planting. Um, that's gonna fill in this year. And I think it's gonna look quite nice. Um, and then just to show you the other side of the planting, um, it was full and had some nice plants as well as um, other invasive ornamentals and just generally needed a little bit of a refresh. So we, we echoed those plants at the other end. Um, so I hope that gives you a little bit of an understanding of my team and how we're working. Um, we have our work cut out for us, but I think we're making progress. I expect that in the next two years, we'll have removed all of the regulated plants off the Maryland list from our design spaces. And I expect that in the next five years, we'll have replaced most of the species of concern from design spaces. Um, this is as well as making progress on managing species 
in areas where elimination, elimination is more challenging. Um, so it's gonna take time, but we will get there um, one truckload at a time. So that was pretty quick. Um, if you have questions or you wanna to touch base later, um, feel free to email me or stop, uh, stop by and say hi if you see us out and about. There's a question, what did you use to replace the fountain grass and other plants? Um, in Old Town, it was, um, there were a bunch of things. There were some yucca, there's a dwarf mat wax myrtle, Coreopsis pubescens. Um, there's probably a dozen, a dozen things in there. I can give you a species list later if you're interested. Um, now, for those of you who didn't catch the very beginning, I am going to be filling in for um, Corinne Stevens. She isn't able to join us today. Um, there was another question if you're taking questions. What's that? How can I get rid of low growing bamboo? Been fighting it for 16 years without success. Oh yeah, I, um, I'm not sure that we have time to get into all the details right now, but that's one that's typically treated with herbicides for heavy machinery, unfortunately. Hey all, I just posted an answer in the chat. All of these, how do I remove questions can be answered by your state's home and garden information center. And they'll give you really good up-to-date advice. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so again, still Anna, um, just standing in for Corinne here. She prepared this presentation um, and I'm gonna do my best to cover the material about the Weed Warrior Volunteer Program. Corinne's the Weed Warrior Program Manager at Montgomery Parks. She included some plant identification at the end of this presentation. Um, I'm not sure that I am gonna get through it. Um, I'm gonna, Marguerite, I'm gonna ask you to, um, for a time check at the end. <laughs> if I don't get to it, the information will be distributed later. Uh, so here we are in Montgomery County. Montgomery Parks um, manages 421 parks within the county. You see them here in dark green. Within Tacoma Park, way down here at the bottom, uh, that includes uh, the streams of Sligo and Long Branch Creek. In the entire county, there are over 490 miles of streams within these parks. So a, a good amount of green space managed by them. To start with, we'll go over the definition of non-native invasive plant. Um, Corinne's favorite term is NNI, which stands for non-native invasive plant. And NNI is a plant that evolved in another part of the world, which is capable of spreading rapidly, causing ecological or economic harm, or is a threat to human health. Um, always remember that some non-native plants stay where they're planted and don't spread or threaten natural areas. Weed warriors are only authorized to control NNIs that are taught in the trainings. Uh, we'll get to some of those examples a little bit later. So the other end of the spectrum then is um, what we're calling a native plant. This is something that is part of a balanced natural ecosystem that is developed over a long period of time within a particular region or ecosystem. So everything is native somewhere, but native flora and fauna have evolved together and often depend on one another for survival and reproduction. The Weed Warrior Program empowers community members who may or not may not have previous backgrounds in plants or ecology to help Montgomery Park staff manage NNIs. This was started in 1999 by the then vegetation ecologist for the park. And Corinne took over this role about two and a half years ago. And in that time, she's really focused on revigorating the volunteer program. The top priority for the program is to save trees from NNIs. 
When an NNI smother or girdle trees and shrubs, they also sh shade out low growing plants and inhibit wildlife movement. The added weight of the vines like those in this picture um, also put strain on the trees and make them more vulnerable to blowing over. Unhealthy trees are unable to put out nuts or fruit that wildlife depend on and freeze trees covered in non-native invasive vines eventually die. So the first priority species of the Weed Warrior Program are all these vines. The pro program is also ready to start moving from a strictly invasive control to a restoration paradigm, which means that they will be engaging with weed warriors in monitoring and other activities like plantings and areas um, where dedicated weed warriors are already working to control non-native invasives. You see here, these are the hand tools that are authorized um, for weed warriors to use on public land. Um, these are also available from a tool library. So the lack of tools should not prevent you from becoming a volunteer. Um, even if weed warriors are adept at using herbicides, power tools, machetes, medics, flamethrowers, or shovels, they may not use them on park property due to safety concerns and to limit soil disturbance. So I mentioned that Corinne was really interested in re reinvigorating this program. And the first thing that she did was to think about how she was going to train people and how trainings could help encourage a more diverse group of people to join. Um, it was decided that every prospective weed warrior would need to attend at least two weed warrior work days before they could be fully trained. There are lots of opportunities in various locations around the county. Um, so it's fairly easy to find some that fit into your schedule. Uh, the, previously, there had been an old e-course, but most of the training was held via in-person trainings. The new Weed War trainings now rely heavily on the brand new e-courses, um, three of them in total, all which are live as of last week. After a Weed Warrior finishes the e-courses, they're then scheduled for a short classroom training, followed by in-person field training with Corinne. These are often done at the same time um, to make it more accessible to a diverse younger group of volunteers. The classroom part is a simple rundown of important points of the e-course, and then you go out and cut some vines with Corinne. She makes sure that you know how to use the tools, as well as um, gives important identification points. Um, another important point for the way that Corinne adjusted the program was to split the certification into two levels. Um, this would make it a little less overwhelming for people who didn't have a plant background. People are welcome to stay level one weed warriors, or they can go on to level two. Um, with the level two certification, um, you are authorized to treat um, a wider range of uh, invasive plants. There's also then a special group of weed warriors um, called Weed Warrior Supervisors. A regular Weed Warrior is only certified to work as an individual and not permitted to lead groups. But these supervisors are specially trained and authorized. They go through background check as well as additional trainings. Um, you'll hear from Jesse later today, who's one of these supervisors. Um, all the public work, Weed Warrior work days and events would not be possible without the supervisor level Weed Warrior. A uh, little plug for the work days. Um, they have events that go on throughout the year across the county. And to be a part of these, you do not re you are not required to have any advanced training. These are led by Weed Warrior supervisors. Um, and it's a great way for volunteers to start to learn how to identify and remove invasive plants. They're also a good way to try out the program and see whether certification is something that you're interested. So when you go to the website here, you'll see uh, multiple events listed um, and she's con continuously updating these. The new e-courses um, look great from what I've seen. They're very well produced and well worth your time to go through. Um, they're required for new certification, but they're also open and encouraged 
for existing volunteers interested in brushing up on their skills. Um, this is a little sneak peek of some of the things that you'll see in the trainings. Uh, they are self-paced. They include um, videos, photos, as well as texts. Um, they're generally pretty engaging. As I mentioned, the two certification levels, um, the main difference is how many species you're allowed to, allowed to target. Um, so with the level one, it's all controlling um, the first priority non-native vines. Um, it's important to note that anyone certified before 2020 is automatically a level two certified weed warrior and may control any of the um, additional weeds. Um, so you see here the list of the six non-native invasives that level one weed warriors are authorized to target. Um, these are all vine species that are um, very abundant in our region. Then if you go on to the higher certification, um, you can target the second priority species um, as well as third and fourth. Mm. Uh, it's also possible if there is a species um, that's not on these lists that Corinne will authorize um, your management of it. You just need to get authorization for that in advance. Anna, this is Marguerite. Yes. yes. Um, your time is up, but I was thinking maybe you could go for five more minutes and we could cut into the question and answers because the questions are being answered by our participants. Okay. Thank you all very much. <laughs> uh, yeah, just tell me when to stop. <laughs> all right, I'll give you five. Okay. okay. Uh, so weed warriors are encouraged to start um, by picking a site that is manageable and not overwhelming. This means picking the small infestations, working towards the larger ones, and also tackling weeds that are easiest for you to identify. Um, so as a review, there are multiple steps to becoming a weed warrior. Um, the first step is to email Corinne. Um, here are some pretty impressive stats. Um, just from 2020. And I think it's important to note that all of this work has been done in a time when uh, COVID protocols uh, limit some of our activities. Um, so I think Corinne is doing great work. Um, again, she was disappointed that she couldn't join us today, um, but please do send her an email. And uh, do you want me to stop there? Or do you want me to intro Margarita into any of these? Um, you can intro. Okay. Okay, so this information is all going to be distributed later. Um, so this is, I'm just going to go over a couple of the very common um, invasives in our region. You see here English ivy, this is all over the place. This is a perennial evergreen. If you're looking out nowadays um, without leaves on the trees, you can see it very easily. It can grow as a ground cover, um, but when it hits a tree, it climbs vertically. Um, that's an issue for the tree health, as well as um, that's also when it sets seed. So what um, weed warriors do is they come through and they sever the vine um, from the trunk of the tree here. Japanese honeysuckle, uh, semi-evergreen vine. Um, the leaf shape, uh, can be hard to go by because it's variable. You see here um, some lobed shape, as well as um, the more often what you see is are these oval leaves. Um, the new the new growth of the stem might be red, but as it ages, um, it gets this dark kind of papery bark. It twines very tightly around plants um, and may even not leaf out until it reaches the top. Um, kudzu. Um, I had never seen so much kudzu before working in Montgomery County. This is one that was actually uh, accidentally, well, intentionally introduced and then got away from us. Um, it was thought to have um, agricultural value. Um, and now it, it grows very quickly up trees um, in wooded areas. Uh, it can grow feet per day. It, it puts out these um, sort of pretty pink flowers um, at the end of summer. Um, 
And each, each section that's rooted in the ground can put out over 30 stems. So that's a lot of biomass um, invading our areas. Mile a minute vine, this one is noteworthy that it's an annual and so can be uh, managed pretty effectively by hand pulling before it flowers or sets seeds. Um, this one, you more often to see it in um, sunny disturbed sites. It has these uh, pretty recognizable arrowhead shaped leaves and then little tiny thorns that grow along the stems. Um, grows, grows pretty quickly um, and then produces a large amount of seed. Oriental bittersweet. Um, this is the most frequent bittersweet you're going to see in our area. There is a native one, but more often than not, what you're seeing is the invasive one. Um, it is deciduous, and often you will see these really attractive um, orange fruit clusters. Um, anyone who's interested in floral arrangements might be familiar with them from um, seeing them on wreaths and whatnot. It grows really thick um, vines that twist and girdle trees. Anna, um, I think yep. we need to move to the next speaker. All right. Thank you. Is that me? <laughs> Is that Sarah? Who's the next speaker? Oh, yeah, Sarah, Sarah go for it. All right, I will share that my will be you. Yeah. I was so busy answering questions in the chat. I'm like, what? Thank you, I Thank appreciate you. it. All right, you should be able to see my screen now. Yep. So my name is Sarah Tangren, and I am the coordinator of the National Capital Prism. We serve Washington, D.C. and all adjacent jurisdictions. Today, I'll be talking with you about the early detection of new invaders. So, so far, we've been talking about the problems we already have and how to deal with them and a little bit about prevention. So what we want to do is get to where we're in a place where things like English ivy don't happen to us anymore. How could we do that? So let's start by discussing this graph. This is called the invasion curve. It's really a very simple curve, but it explains why we keep getting into this mess. The vertical axis is the area occupied by alien species, and the horizontal axis is time. This blue arrow represents the point of introduction, and by that we mean the time at which an alien species begins escaping into the wild. Before introduction, in this little bit of space down here in the far lower left corner, before introduction, the best management option available to us is called prevention. Examples of successful prevention efforts. Examples of successful prevention measures that we could take include landscaping with native plants or landscaping with safer alien plants than we do now, buying locally grown plants, whether they're native or not, is another prevention me measure that we could take. Right now, a lot of the plants we buy are grown in the South and they are shipped long distances. Those plants and pots and the potting soils can all carry invasive alien hitchhikers. For example, we can help to prevent the introduction of these alien frogs. These are Cuban tree frogs. And they hitchhike rides in uh, house plants as shown in the lower left corner. And they eat native frogs as shown in the upper right corner. 
After the point of introduction, there are only a few individuals of the new, new to us alien species in the wild, usually within a very small area. Also, the rate of spread is slow as indicated by this gentle slope on the curve. The best management option for us at this point in time is to find those escapees, the aliens that have made it into the wild and eradicate them. An example of an eradication effort that is going on right now in Northern Virginia is the two-horned trappa. It is an aquatic invasive plant that has been spreading from pond to pond there for about 20 years. Remember, I said, when these things begin, they tend to proceed slowly. And so far, we have found it in only 76 ponds, 76 ponds in 20 years. We could easily eradicate this plant if we had funding. And in so doing, we would save taxpayers millions of dollars by preventing it from reaching the Chesapeake and ultimately the rest of North America. As an alien species continues to spread and cover more area, the rate of increase also increases, as indicated by the steeper slope on the graph. We are seeing this with the two-horned trappa now. Whereas it used to spread one or two new ponds per year, it is currently spreading two, 10 to 20 new ponds per year. This part of the curve tends to be, and this is critical, this is the part of the curve where the public tends to become aware of the situation. Somewhere on this slope, the area covered becomes so large that eradication is no longer feasible. So our awareness starts after the option for eradication is passed. The best management option available to us is called containment. It involves slowing or preventing spread to new areas. Spotted lanternfly provides an example of a containment effort. Since it was discovered on a shipment of landscaping stones in Pennsylvania, so we shipped landscaping stones from China to Pennsylvania. And now we have this, people are working to limit its spread into new areas. Some alien species continue to spread until they occupy all of the available habitat. Our only option here is called long-term management. Our options, truly are not good by the time we reach the right-hand side of this graph. Which brings us back to the topic of English ivy. Either we manage the ivy of our forest or our forest will die. No one has infinite resources, so we have to prioritize the places we will protect and pray that a biocontrol can be developed. So, how do we break this cycle? We have to get out of this cycle. In 2017, the National Invasive Species Council proposed the Invader Detectives Program. The concept is to train citizen scientists to recognize and report alien species that are in the early phases of invasion. Documenting these invasions early while they can still be eradicated is the key to both more success and less expenditure. So that brings me to uh, the point where I can show you the Invader Detectives Program project page. And uh, this is on iNaturalist and I will post the link in the chat. You are welcome to join our project page using this little button up here. And this is the map that you will see on the project page, as I said, DC and adjacent areas. 
And this part down here is really cool. This is the live feed from over 6,000 observations that are coming in a continuous stream from citizen scientists in our region. I wanted to show you how to um, make a report very briefly. And mostly what I wanna show you is how fun and easy this is to do. You just need to download the iNaturalist app on your smartphone, then go to the bottom where there's this camera icon and click it, it says observe. That takes you to a second screen where you click on the camera button. That lets your phone take uh, photographs that will be uploaded to the website. And then there are three things to do on this next screen. One is look at the photo thumbnails and see if you like them. Um, leave some field notes and answer these questions down here. But this is the really important question. Let us know if you're taking a photo of a planted plant, something cultivated or something that has escaped into the wild. Very briefly, I want to show you some pictures of some of the early detection species. We are tracking 41 species, uh, but so here are just three to show you some evergreens that you can actually go out and see and report right now. This is Italian arum. Uh, this is showing up in parks. It is occupying the forest floor. It has proven its ability to establish monocultures but it is just now moving into our region. We could stop this. This is liriope. This is the stuff that is often referred to as li lily turf. And uh, I think that it is probably underreported. This is a patch of it on the forest floor in Rock Creek Park. And to most people that just looks like some grass. Um, and so we train invader detectives, which I'll talk about in a minute, how to recognize this so that they can report it. And this is one of our most beautiful landscaping shrubs. Unfortunately, it produces these very interesting blue fruits, which the birds eat. And apparently whenever a bird eats the fruit from an alien plant, it flies directly to the nearest park to poop uh, because these are showing up all over our local parks, still in very small quantities. So this is something, again, we could eradicate this. Now, as I said, there are 41 species on our list and that is a lot of information. So what we do is we have a list serve and that serves two primary purposes. One is so that our whole invader detectives community can communicate, share thoughts, ask each other questions, but also so that about once a week, we can post the information that they need to go out and look for whatever is really apparent at that time of year. And so this post here to the listserv is an example about holly osmanthus, which is evergreen, a large shrub that looks an awful lot like American holly. And so the listserv post just gives the volunteers the information they need to go out, recognize Holly Osmanthus and make a good report. So I hope after all of that, you're really motivated to become an invader detective. If you would like to email me and in the subject line, if you would put the word list serve, that's very helpful because I receive something around 50 emails a day. <laughs> Um, so please put listserv in the subject line, and I will add you to the Invader Detectives listserv, and you will get information through the listserv about a training event that we have coming up next week. Um, it's about one hour, it's online, and you will also get invitations when we go out and have a group field event, um, and we have one of those coming up in March as well, and 
unfortunately, there are a lot of really invaded places that we can go look at and, and get some field experience. All right, I will stop sharing. And I think we're holding questions to the end. So do we go to the next speaker? Yeah, let's go ahead with Jesse's presentation. Jesse, are you ready? Yeah, I am. I should be. Let's see. All right, can you see my screen? Yeah, can you make it full screen? Um, let's see. Yeah, that's better. That's better. Yeah, somehow I lost my notes though. Um, I'm gonna escape real quick. Yep. What do you see now? Uh, we do. We see your notes. Hmm. All right, so let's, um, let me try this one more time. Sorry, folks. Okay, so. Now we see your the right screen. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't see my notes. Oh, um, how's that? It's fine. Good. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jesse Buff. Um, I am the Invasive Vines uh, Program Coordinator with the Chesapeake Climate Action Network. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, today about um, how we got to this program and what we're doing and where we're going. Um, I'm going to build a little bit of, on what, um, what uh, Anna and Sarah have already talked about, um, but with more of a focus on vines um, and what we're doing about them. Um, just to review the um, the numerous threats that um, are posed by vines. Um, they, as many of you know, they smother trees and shrubs, they block light, they um, shade and outcompete low growing plants, they inhibit wildlife movement. If you can imagine, our nut hatches and woodpeckers can't move up and down the trees looking for insects if there's a um, uh, thick English ivy vines preventing that. Um, I think probably most importantly, they make trees more vulnerable to blowing over in storms due to their added weight um, and surface area that they create. And of course, they climb, twist, and strangle trees and shrubs, eventually girdling and killing them by cutting off the flow of water and nutrients. Um, so all that's really bad for trees, right? But um, here is the Chesapeake Climate Action Network's interest in this. Um, climate change and invasives are really something of a double-edged sword. Climate change will positively affect many invasive plant species, meaning that they will continue to grow um, exponentially. And it will also stress um, the trees that are already stressed by vines. Um, so we saw this um, with the sudden oak decline a few years ago where we had um, climate change contribute to the death of a number of oaks in this region. So um, the added stress of vines is really going to be a one-two punch. Um, so we're gonna have a lot of trees dying because of vines. Um, and when that happens, we lose a key tool in our ability to both um, mitigate climate change because trees um, sequester carbon, they store carbon, um, as well as adapting to it. Trees um, 
help cool our local environment and they mitigate uh, stormwater run runoff. Um, so they really help us uh, adapt to climate change. Um, so if we lose those trees, we're going to be losing the, the, this really important um, natural climate solution. Um, and the good news here is that saving trees is much easier and, and it's less expensive than planting them. And when we save trees, especially large trees, we're getting a bigger bang for your carbon dollar because um, larger trees sequester more carbon, and store more carbon than younger trees. So just a little bit of background of how, how we got here. Um, early in the pandemic, our executive director, um, Mike Tidwell, who lives here in Tacoma Park, many of you know, um, he, like many of us, uh, began walking around um, his town uh, and seeing a, a lot of invasive vines uh, strangling trees. Um, and so he was thinking to himself, you know, how can we be letting this happen in a place where, um, you know, here in Tacoma Park, at least we, we have a very uh, robust tree canopy. Um, we have a very strong tree protection code and we consider ourselves to be environmentally progressive. Um, so if we're letting this happen, um, it's gotta be bad in other places. And so with, with his anecdotal observations of this invasive vine problem, he really wanted to see if we could, um, if he could codify it. So he hired me to do an assessment of Tacoma Park and our invasive vine problem here within the, um, the city limits. So I got to work um, in, at this time last year in early February of 2021, um, basically assessing every single property um, in this town. I used a, um, a simple Google form on my phone. Um, I recorded what ward the, the trees were in. Um, oh, to, I, sh I should back up. I re recorded um, basically every um, tree that was significantly affected by um, invasive vines yeah, that I could tell within the um, city limits. Um, I recorded the, the wards, the addresses, the property types, whether it was a school, a park, a single family home, um, an apartment building, so on and so forth. Um, because this was in February, I um, mostly recorded um, evergreen species, which were uh, English ivy and winter creeper, but I also did note um, deciduous vines such as wisteria and porcelain berry where I could, but it was harder to um, see those vines because they didn't have um, leaves on them. And it was also hard to key them out, um, at, especially at a distance, but I noted them where it was pretty obvious. And what I considered to be affected trees, the trees that I counted, were ones that were moderately to severely affected by vines, trees that if no action was taken would succumb to vines within five to seven years. And this was a little bit subjective, um, but I considered them to be affected by vines by virtue of the tree's relative size, that is a small tree that will be overwhelmed by vines shortly, um, or the amount of vines covering their trunks or the um, or the canopy of that tree. Um, and I also took note of um, priority trees, such as this one in this slide, you know, trees that were really, really hammered by these vines, or um, a property that um, I considered a priority would be um, one that had a, a lot of trees that were being affected by vines, or one uh, particularly mature tree that was, you know, gonna, gonna die because of the vines. And so what I found in this assessment was, was pretty striking. We had um, over 5,000 trees within limit of, limits of Tacoma Park um, that were um, moderately to severely affected by vines. Um, and these were mostly um, on single family, um, single family homes, uh, properties, and, as well as parks. And taken together, homes were 47% of the affected trees within Tacoma Park and parks were another 
27%. So together that 74% of all affected trees were both on single family home properties and um, parks. And so that's where we've um, focused our efforts since then. Um, so shortly after I conducted this assessment and, and, and we put it out there to the world, um, I wrote it up, um, it's on our website. Um, we turned this assessment into the Tacoma Tree Saver Program. Uh, and we started um, with formalized volunteer events um, last April. We, we got some good press on, um, on WAMU. Some of you heard the story. We were also covered in the Tacoma Park newsletter and uh, the Maryland Matters um, online uh, Maryland politics uh, magazine. And so what we've been doing since we started, um, we basically, we, we hold volunteer events every Saturday morning. We meet at a central location here in Tacoma Park. Um, and we, we meet at 8.30. Uh, and we were, we're taking really a, a multi-pronged approach. Um, so from the beginning, we, we started going door to door. We gave volunteers, we would train them up fairly quickly. We would um, go door to door and volunteers would, would have in hand um, a list of all the properties that, that I had identified that had invasive trees, or, um, invasive vines. Um, and people would talk with the homeowners and um, tell them about the problem and, and offer to, to cut the, the vines off their trees right there on the spot. Um, and so we did that. But we, we quick re quickly realized that this was um, a little bit um, kind of slow going. Um, so we quickly um, pivoted to um, doing group events on, on park properties where there was a real concentration of trees um, with, with vines. And that, that way we really started um, kind of uh, cutting cutting as many vines as possible, we really started getting our numbers up quickly. Um, and, and this is, I, I, I have to give a shout out to the Montgomery County um, Weed Warrior Program because our collaboration uh, with Weed Warriors um, has, has made our, our, our success possible. Um, so we've been really focusing um, for the last couple months on, on parks and on rights of ways. Uh, within the town, um, in some cases, apartment buildings that had a lot of trees that were affected. Um, and the other way that we're doing our work is that we're, um, I'm trying to find people who are interested in doing this work on their own. And, and I call them Tacoma tree stewards. And these are people who, who I train to, um, to basically interact with, with their neighbors um, and, and do the work on their own. Um, uh, on their own time. And so these are the three ways that we're doing the work, door to door, um, focusing on concentrated areas um, through group events and having these um, nested Tacoma tree stewards um, in their neighborhoods. And so our, our results are, are, are pretty, pretty cool. I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of what we've done. Uh, so we've hosted 42 Saturday events um, since last April. Uh, we've had, um, close to 270 uh, total volunteers. And of these 165 are, are unique volunteers, meaning uh, those are um, the, re the, the delta between those are, are people that have gone come multiple times to multiple events. And we've contributed um, more than 18,000 total work hours uh, to the community. Um, so big shout out to all of our volunteers. Um, of the almost uh, 5,000 trees that we originally identified, um, we have cleared vines from uh, almost 3,500 of those trees, and that's about 69% of the originally identified uh, trees with vines. So, so we're getting close to our goal of clearing all of these trees. Um, what makes this successful? Um, I think people really like it because it is a tangible climate action. Um, you know, a lot of people have what we call climate anxiety. Um, you know, they're, they're worried about climate change. They're, they're worried about not doing enough. And this is something tangible that people can do. And um, it's fun. Uh, people like getting out there and, and killing bad stuff. 
Um, it's it's fun to to feel like you're you're helping these majestic old trees. Um, another thing that really makes it work is is our wonderful volunteers, and and I. I want to give a shout out to those of you who are volunteers with us. Um, I saw a couple of your names on the Zoom. Um, we've had a number of repeat volunteers, um, people who keep coming out week after week. And then we also have super volunteers, people who actually um, do the door to door work. They communicate with their um, their neighbors and they do follow up calls they do um, visits to people who who have expressed an interest in having their vines cut and again um, our partnership with montgomery parks and the weed warrior program we couldn't do it without them um, the challenges from from my perspective are um that we we're having trouble getting in touch with homeowners, you know, when, when we when we knock on their door and they're not home and we leave a flyer in their mailbox, um, you know, it's 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 a good thing when we get a call back, but we don't get as many callbacks as we'd like. And, and another challenge is is that it's hard to reach the owners of apartment buildings and multifamily dwellings. Um, and I'm open to any suggestions uh, that people might have for, for how to get in touch with those, um, those entities. Um, but some of the opportunities are that I think this program, um, we're, we're getting a lot of great uh, public feedback. Um, there's a lot of word of mouth. We're noticing that, um, that people are starting to cut vines. Uh, we're seeing the evidence of this in places that we haven't worked. Um, so, so we can tell that there is some uptake. And um, another great thing is that we've been recognized by the city. There was a, a mayoral proclamation uh, earlier this year recognizing our work. So that, that felt good. Um, here are a couple of our champion vines and our champion um, interns from last summer. Look at the size of those vines that, that we removed. Um, here's another... Uh, uh, look at some of our success. That's a before and after shot near the Tacoma um, Middle School, um, a tree covered with uh, porcelain berry. And then just a, a few weeks later, you can see it, see it dying. Okay, so, so where, where do we go from here? Um, so we've had a lot of success so far. Um, over the next few months, um, we're going to be finishing uh, the parks, we're going to be uh, clearing all the vines from the, uh, the, um, the trees that we've identified in parks, and we're almost there. Um, we're going to finish our door to door work, we're going to prioritize um, the unvisited homes, homes that, that we haven't yet reached, as well as the priority houses, and we're going to be starting that work pretty soon. Um, we're going to continue our outreach, you know, putting messages out um, on listservs, on uh, Tacoma, Tacoma Park uh, social media. Um, and the other thing that I really want to get off the ground that, that, that's been a little bit slow to start, I'll have to admit, is, this, is the idea of the tree stewards. Um, and these are the, the, the people who are embedded in their neighborhoods, people who, who I'm able to train. Uh, these are boots on the ground ambassadors for the program. Um, they really complement our work because they can they can get out there and and kind of um, strengthen our, our messaging and work with their neighbors to to, to rid their trees of invasive vines. Um, and they can do this um, on their own at their convenience that they can do it in the evenings, um, uh, in the mornings, whenever they have time. And, and also their, their local knowledge is key. Um, so if you know anyone that's interested in becoming a Tacoma tree steward, please send them my, my way. Um, we're going to be moving um, actually over the border um, into Tacoma, D.C. quite, quite soon. Um, so if anyone has contacts in that neighborhood, we're going to be starting that work pretty soon. In fact, I've got an intern out there today who's doing an assessment in Tacoma, D.C., and the other thing that, that, that I'm excited about is that um, we want to export our model to other places. Um, you know, the, with, the, with the success that we've seen in Tacoma Park, um, people are start coming, starting to come to, to us to, to say, hey, how can I get this, um, a, a similar program started in my town or in my community? 
Um, and so we want to develop a number of tools that we can help people get their own uh, program started. Um, how can you become involved? Um, you can come out to any one of our uh, work days every Saturday morning. Um, you can become a Tacoma Tree Steward. As I mentioned earlier, please send me an email. Um, oh, I'll put our website up on our last slide. Um, you can talk with your neighbors about in invasive vines and, and let them know about our program. We're happy to come do the work for, for them. Um, you can snitch on them to me if you want. Um, the other thing that I highly recommend is that you become a weed warrior through the county. Um, this is the best way to learn about invasive uh, plant species um, and get trained on it, even if you don't ever do any work on county property. Not that I would suggest that, but um, it is a great way to learn about invasive plant species. So with that, um, thank you. Um, I look forward to hearing from you. Send me an email. Um, check out our website. Send me any suggestions uh, that you might have. And I appreciate it. Thank you, Jesse. Next up, we have Lily and um, the representative from council. Was it Lickie's office? Yes, Delegate Lukey's office, Brad Fallon. I'm here. Great, thank you, Brad. Brad, do you want me to start or how do you want to run it? I know well, you're- yeah, I'm just looking type. at you. Why don't you kick off and uh, in anything I can add, I'm happy to. Great. All right, well, can you pull up my PowerPoint, please, Anna? First slide, please. First slide. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Lily Fountain. I'm with uh, Maryland Sierra Club. I'm chair of the statewide committee, Natural Places Committee. And uh, we work with uh, trees, native plants, wildlife, streams, and land use issues for Sierra Club. We have many work groups and uh, many campaigns we're working right now on, including a campaign for the Invasive Species Bill and also a campaign for uh, stream restorations, which also have a big impact on invasive species along our streams. So um, I also have with me uh, the Chief of Staff for Delegate Lukey, who is the sponsor of the Invasive Species Bill, Invasive and Native Plants Bill. And uh, so I'm going to be reviewing that a little bit with you. I'm not going to spend, okay, beep, to, and uh, I'm not going to spend much time on these two. I just want to emphasize that the general public does not understand why non-native uh, plants are not good in the sense that they don't feed our wildlife and have advantages in growing and expanding that native species don't experience because they have predators that evolve with them. So that's just an important point. I would you know, make sure we always share with people we're trying to explain why this is a bad thing. Beep. Um, uh, another uh, health effect you're probably aware of is the connection between amur honeysuckle and ticks. I myself from my invasive work have experienced exposure a couple of times and um, so that's an important thing to know. And also, you know, there was so much concern about parks this season and that invasives are a big uh, issue for the parks also. Beep. Um, so. When Sierra Club and other organizations, we knew we wanted to do stuff and initially Delegate Lutke called us and said in 2021, hey, I'd like your support as I develop this bill. And we had a nice bill that prohibited the use of state funds for invasive species with some exceptions, um, but it was still a huge problem. And as you know, we alluded to the Department of Agricultural list several times. I mean, Ivy isn't even on that list, you know? So there's a lot of problems with that list. Um, so we knew we had work to do, beep, beep. <laughs> uh, I think we skipped back a little bit, please. All right, all right, there we go. So just some of the many organizations, PRISM, I apologize, I don't have you on the list, they are very important too, but these were the ones we were working immediately for for certain, some of our meetings, Sierra Club, Maryland Native Plant Society, Nancy Lawson, who wrote a great book, The Humane Gardener, Deborah Landolf from the Invasive Plant Advisory Committee, IPAC, uh, Wild Ones with Marnie Bruce, 
National Aquarium, Nature Conservancy. Uh, they have been very involved, Chesapeake Bay Foundation and many others. So um, there's many environmental organizations that are involved in this because it's been mentioned, we're all concerned about it and we know about it. The farmers are interested in this issue though also because of their crops. Uh, of course, we've been talking about DNR, lawn care companies and weed warrior programs we've talked a lot about and Department of Transportation. They actually are concerned about all the dead trees falling on the roads and some other issues. Beep. Um, so beep again. So what I want to tell you about is this bill that is in relatively promising shape in the Senate right now. And what this bill is called is Invasive and Native Plants. And it will require MDA, the, the Department of Agriculture, to conduct assessments of the plants that are in a very good reference. Maybe some of you have this on your bookshelf, the plant invaders of mid-Atlantic natural areas that is being currently revised, is being uh, led by Jill Swearington. And it's a great book. It's got about eight, the new version is gonna have about 80 species. The old one had 55. It's a big advance over our previous things. I do have a link. I don't know if we're sharing the slides later, but. Uh, I'll try to cut and paste it into the chat uh, later after I get off um, for where you can actually get this version uh, online. And also uh, it would uh, let them categorize some other things if they weren't in the book that could be there. Beep. So th that's a really big step. As you can see, there's so many species that were mentioned today that weren't even on the current list. Also for native plants, they're going to list native plants for alternatives. Somebody asked that question in the chat. So that's part of this bill. And also um, to prioritize the use of native plants whenever possible. Now they do, they do that a lot, but you know, more encouragement for that. So beep. So now it's a little civics lesson, which you may be completely aware of. And forgive me if you're, if you're already aware of all this, but to make some of these changes at the state level, we have to understand uh, how things go. So you get a bill. So hopefully you work with the legislator to get a bill that does what you want it to do ahead of the session. And then it gets read into the, the um, whichever chamber it's starting with, a Senate bill starts in the Senate, a House bill. Some bills are cross-filed, the same version of both houses at the same time. Sometimes it's just one bill and it gets immediately referred to committee. So the first step that sometimes the public isn't aware of is it has to get out of committee. If it doesn't get out of committee, it can't be voted on by your legislator in the floor unless your legislator happens to be on the committee. So that's very important. And then if it passes committee, it goes to the floor and then it has to um, be, you know, be voted on by all the people in that house. And that's the third reading. And then it goes to the opposite chamber if it passes that chamber on the floor. And that's where we are with the Senate bill for this invasive species. So that's very exciting. So I'm here today to encourage you to help get it through the House on the other side and then to the governor. OK, so those are the governor is the final step. I think it's not showing up too well. That gray line at the bottom is getting the governor to sign it. So we have to get back to the House from the Senate and get it through the committee there. Then we have to and, and maybe uh, Brad can give us some more insight into all this and then you know, any kind of working out of the two different versions of the bill and then getting it to the governor. So that's our goal. And what I want to do, beep, can you? Okay, so, you know, so here are these steps that I just kind of went through, going through the first committee to the floor, the second over to the other chamber, the other committee, then the floor and then the governor, okay? And then we're gonna celebrate at the end if we can, you know, really work at the state legislature level for, for improving this situation, beep. Um, so, you know, you, you meeting with your legislators, the best, a sign on letter written by someone else adding your own comments is something probably many of you receive if you belong to any of these groups that we often do that. And I just really want to beg your uh, support for this bill. We have had a lot of support. I mean, uh, uh, Delegate Lukey has told us that, you know, there's a lot of people interested in this bill. Um, you know, hoping this will pass, saying, oh, that sounds nice. I hope it passes is the least effective strategy. So I hope that's not the one that you're going to be doing. But I'm going to give you a link. Beep. Beep. So this is this is the link. And I'm going to have the QR code to get your camera ready um, to for the Sierra Club. We have a campaign. It actually has two other great bills that both impact invasives. 
which is the parks bill and, and, and working on invasives in the parks as part of preserving the parks. And also the Maryland the Beautiful bill, which is about conserving land. And one of those, one a big part of that uh, Maryland Beautiful Act is to give money to a land trust for stewardship of mature trees. So this whole save trees from ivy thing, big part of that. So all three of these bills, if you click on this link, you will be sending a letter to your legislature, which you can read the letter, you can add your own comments to the letter and really help us get this through. We just let this through this morning. And at last I checked just before this meeting, there were 143 signatures already. So we're looking for at least 500. The more, the better, the more it's gonna get some of the people. And eh, is this really worth, you know, they're bombarded with bills. And if, you know, this would be really nice if we could uh, get this through. So I hope you will sign beep. So here's a QR code. If you have a QR reader on your phone, even if you don't yet take the picture <laughs> of the QR code and it'll take you straight to the website. But if you just Google uh, protect, protect parks and lands, Sierra Club, you'll get, probably get the campaign. So now I wanna turn it over to Brad to say anything else you wanna say, correct anything I said that was wrong or update us. Tell me it's passed somewhere else. What if? <laughs> what have you got, Brad? Yep. Lily, you just married my two favorite worlds, which is like bleak legislative procedure and environmental work. So I love that. I loved your presentation. <laughs> uh, everything she said was accurate. Uh, absolutely. And, and uh, I don't think I need to go through too many details of the bill. Although uh, if anybody has a question, I'm happy to answer them in the chat. Or if you want to uh, ask it here directly, I'm not sure what the Q&A situation is, but happy to go through any details. Like Lily said, the bill just passed the Senate. It passed both committee and the full Senate unanimously, which is incredibly exciting. And I have to tell you, a lot of that work got done before this session. And I have to thank Lily. And I recognize many of you on this chat that I know have been talking to legislators and people in the governmental space about what invasive and native plants even are and why invasive plants are so damaging, what it takes to get rid of them, and best practices to make sure that we're not dealing with them in the future. Uh, because frankly, a lot of legislatures, legislators just were not familiar with these a couple years ago. And now it's becoming something that many people are familiar with and, and realizing that we have to take action on. So I'm actually just a second ago got word that our the Senate bill is going to be uh, in the House side of um, the uh, Natural Resources Subcommittee here in just a little bit at 4 p.m. today. Uh, I'll be tuning in then, but I don't foresee any issues with it. I think that we're feeling pretty good. You know, it, it's always my favorite type of update when I get to talk to a bunch of advocates interested in a bill and get to say, hey, we don't have anybody opposing it because because that's where we are right now. You know, I know Lily mentioned last year we had a piece of legislation passed that blocked any uh, public money from being used to purchase invasive species. Although they are saying they're not doing that right now, the invasive list is it might as well not be a list, right? There's hardly anything on it. So we're adding teeth to an effort that was passed last year and we're building on it. And, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, uh, put the cart before the horse here and get too celebratory before we get this bill passed. But I, th I think we feel good about where we are. But even if we get this bill passed this year, there's going to be more work to do. Uh, and, and that's a certainty, right? It's going to take some pressure on the Department of Agriculture to make sure that the invasive plants that are adopted from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services list are designated tier one or tier two correctly, right? We want to make sure that the most harmful uh, plants are banned in Maryland and you can't buy them. And if they're all designated as tier two, uh, we need to follow through on that. And if other plants are designated as tier two that we don't think should be, we need to make sure that nurseries and stores around the state are uh, in compliance with uh, letting the consumers uh, know that they are in fact invasive species. So there's gonna be a lot more work to do. I'm sure that the experts on this call could tell me uh, steps to build on because certainly I am not an expert in this space. I, I'm a government nerd. Uh, but thank you all for all of your work so far in getting this done, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Marguerite. Yeah. Okay, I just stopped, stopped sharing the screen. Okay, um, so we have a, a number of questions. 
that have come from through our chat. And um, it's a little difficult. <laughs> it's never easy to prioritize questions that have come through the chat. Um, I have um, one in per some that I think really would best go to Corinne, but um, Anna, maybe you can handle them. One is, um, does the city of Tacoma Park have codes related to tier one invasives? Um, so the city plant code does not cover, um, it doesn't, it does include a few species. It includes bamboo um, and things from encroaching on neighbor properties. It doesn't prohibit the planting on um, private properties. Okay. If, if um, I could add, add to um, what Anna's saying though, there is code that is supposed to prevent the, um, the homeowners and landowners from allowing noxious growth. Um, and I don't know how often this is actually um, enforced. Am I right, um, Anna? You probably are. That's something that goes through our code compliance office. Um, and it's they're very specific about what is considered noxious. So some of these, some of these um, ornamentals would not be considered noxious um, for that, is my understanding. Um, Sarah, I have a couple questions for you. Thank you, Anna. Um, once a citizen scientist posts um, something about invasives and identifies an invasive plant, what do they do about the plant? So I'm guessing that the question means once they post it to the iNaturalist and Invader Detectives, yeah, I think so. And too. that's a really good question because we have a list of 41 species. And the way that we got that list was by having all of the cooperating members, the parks and, and some other land management agencies vote for things that they have um, the desire and capacity to respond to once a report is made. So people who are reporting things through iNaturalist, their information is getting used and it is helping. It's not just an exercise and <laughs> let's make a report, right? Um, that being said, it does get complicated because some land man management agencies voted for some things while other land management agencies voted for others. So it doesn't mean everyone that belongs voted for the same species. And also a response can be any of a number of things. So if you have staff, you could, or weed warriors, you could send someone straight to the site to clean up a small infestation. If it's a bigger infestation, you may have, your response may be to re use the report as documentation that you can go up the chain in your organization and say, we need funding in order to respond to this. So right now they don't have that documentation. Okay. Yeah, and I would just echo that um, I've found some of those reports useful for me as well. And, and this is another question for you, Sarah. Um, is the invader detection different? How is the invader detection program different from Weed Warriors? So the, they work together and um, Weed Warriors can be invader detectives. All you, all you have to do is whip out the phone, take a picture of the issue and report it. Uh, so most of the, and yeah, there really, there's overlap, but the weed warrior component is about removing, the invader detective component is about uh, documenting. Okay. Um, thank you. Anna, are you prepared to answer any questions about weed warriors? I can try. Jesse is okay. uh, also on here. He is a experienced weed warrior. All right, well, maybe between the two of you. We have one question about why are cuts in wisteria only fourth priority? Um, so my understanding from talking to Corinne about that is uh, 
for kudzu, for example, is that it's so widespread um, that it's 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 not the most effective thing to go after. Jesse, do you have other thoughts on that? Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, and it could just be um, prevalence too, or, or, or the way in which it, it's distributed. Like it could, it could be sort of the patchiness where it's really bad in certain places, but not as widely distributed, such as um, English ivy, but I, I can't confirm that. Yeah, I could add a thought to that. I'm with the DC Department of Energy and Environment. And for us, for our organization, that's a top priority. And it's specifically because of, of what Jesse said. But in the District of Columbia, we've done pretty good at controlling it. And we think, you know, we'll get scattered small reports and we'll get on top of it. Okay. Um, and then here's a question that somebody asked about our in terms of weed warriors, are there any parks or areas that have been particularly successful for weed warriors in the county, like where, where they've made a difference? I think there have. I think that's a question for Corinne to point out yeah. the best spots, but there definitely have been. Uh, I, will, I will tell you one thing about that. If you are hiking on a trail through Montgomery County, and you are not seeing trees that are being killed by English ivy, it's mostly because of weed warriors. There are occasionally, occasionally there are contractors, but mm -hmm. in any place where you go and everything isn't covered by invasives, that's a sign that the weed warriors are succeeding and making <laughs> a difference. I'm sorry to laugh, but you know, that's really true. You have to intervene true. when you see all those because they're just, they're invasive, what you say. Yeah. Um, now we're out of, we're out of town time. It's 1.30. I have one last question that I think would probably be fun to answer. Are any of the invasives um, fit for human consumption? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like what? I know that garlic mustard has been one that people try to create events around. Um, but that's the only one, that's the first one that's popping into my mind. I don't think it's particularly delicious. You may be able to eat things. It doesn't mean that you would want to eat them. <laughs> um, yeah, Japanese knotweed, apparently the, um, the young shoots are, are particularly good as well. Um, but I also, I think there are rules about um, removing any plants from uh, uh, certain, certain, uh, Parklands. I, I know that National Park Service is, is very strict about actually removing um, even invasives for human consumption. Yeah. yeah. So, what are there, sorry, go ahead, Sarah. Oh, yeah. There, there are a whole bunch of invasives that are edible. A number of them were introduced because they are edible. Uh, probably the 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 prime example of that would be wineberry. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I come upon a wineberry uh, during fruiting season, I make it my personal responsibility to strip it of all the berries, you know, out of concern for <laughs> the invasion and the ecology. Um, there are also several fish species that are edible. And this is a problem within the uh, invasion ecology community because if we promote them as being edible in order to increase awareness, then some people go out and either plant them or in the case of fish, they release them into ponds and lakes where they didn't exist before. And then the communities there are destroyed. So, I know. <laughs> and and all, if I could also add, sometimes when, when you're picking and harvesting, you're also inadvertently spreading as well. Yeah. 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 Well, I was just going to My neighbor used to make, um, make us food out of her bamboo shoots all the time. So that was always fun. Let's get um, some real food. Let's get some real food. Right. And I was right. just going to add tangentially um, one of the issues that we didn't talk about is that. Uh, the issue of deer um, and the overabundance of them. And um, one of the issues is that deer are not consuming the invasive plants um, the yeah. same way that they are native plants. So, yeah. 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 
Well, I guess that's really it for the time. I just wanted to remind everybody to support the um, Invasive Species Bill, that's um, House Bill 15 and Senate Bill 7, correct? So contact your delegates. Senate, and, Senate Bill 7 is the one right now. That's seven, but, but just sign the letter. It'll go to the right people for the right bill. <laughs> right, right. So that we can start to move on this invasive species list and get it expanded into lots of areas that uh, lots of plants that are not on the list right now because it is, as Lily said, a very short list right now. So. And thank you to Anna and Marguerite for taking care of us today and organizing all this. Well, I want to thank Delegate Lutke for sponsoring the bill and leading the charge on this and other issues to help preserve our ecosystems. Yes, thank you. And Brad for being here as his representative. He, he always keeps us up to date. And I'll let you know, uh, Marguerite, what, what the outcomes are. Okay. We've already gotten 50 signatures since the beginning of the meeting. Oh. <laughs> well, if there were over 100 participants that showed up today, so hopefully everyone will be able to sign up. Uh, every Maryland resident will be able to sign those. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for joining us. Um, and just as a recap, uh, we'll be sending out a recording of this presentation as well as posting it to the Tally website. Um, and we will work on sharing the presentations as well. So. Okay, well, thank you everybody for attending and all the speakers and this was lots of fun and we've all learned a lot. So appreciate it all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great, thank you.